<clears throat> All right, and we are live. So welcome door grow hackers to the door grow show. If you are a property management entrepreneur that wants to add doors, make a difference, increase revenue, help others, impact lives, and you are interested in growing your business and life, and you are open to doing things a bit differently, then you are a door grow hacker. Door grow hackers love the opportunities, daily variety, unique challenges, and freedom that property management brings. Many in real estate think you're crazy for doing it. You think they're crazy for not because you realize that property management is the ultimate high trust gateway to real estate deals, relationships, and residual income. At DoorGrow, we are on a mission to transform property management businesses and their owners. We want to transform the industry, eliminate the BS, build awareness, change perception, expand the market, and help the best property management entrepreneurs win. I'm your host, property management growth expert, Jason Hull, the founder and CEO of DoorGrow. Now, let's get into the show. And this, this guest that we have today is a fantastic gentleman named Mark Cunningham. Mark, you're not a stranger to most people probably listening to this show. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jason. I'm really excited to have you here. I, I, it's it's strange that you haven't been on here yet. At the beginning of the show, I was like, have you been on here? And you're like, no. And I said, it's long overdue. It's I've just long been overdue. waiting for the invitation. Okay. Well, I'm glad <laughs> we finally got you invited. So I'm glad you're here. And today's topic is going to be the five characteristics of successful PM companies. And before we get into that, Let's. I want you to share a little bit of your background to qualify yourself to the audience, um, help them understand how you got into property management and what your connection is to, you know, uh, these five characteristics of a successful company. Absolutely. So uh, let me ask. Let me start by asking you a question. Uh, what were you doing in 1978, Jason? 1978. Yeah. I was um, probably pooping in a diaper okay. and drinking breast milk. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. That that image there. Uh, well, 1978. Seven. So okay. I mean, okay. Yeah. So you're one, and I wasn't much older than that. But in 1978, my dad uh, decided that he was going to quit teaching. He was a school teacher, a middle school teacher, and he was going to kind of follow his entrepreneurial real estate dream. And so he opened up a real estate property management company, Grace Property Management, 1978 uh, in Denver. So I was I was employee number one because I was free child labor. So my dad would have me doing all the things that kids probably shouldn't do. You know, he would have me showing properties and mowing lawns and collecting rent and uh, filling out leases, just anything that needed to be done. I, I grew up in that world. And so it really kind of gave me uh, a unique view into, into real estate, into property management, and just into business because that's, that's all I knew. That's all we did. So as I got older, um, I'd take my summers and I'd, I'd work for him in the summers and Again, just doing whatever needed done. So if, if I got real lucky, if it got too hot out, I'd work in the office. If it got over 110 degrees, the deal was I'd get to come in the office. Otherwise, I'm mowing lawns. So I uh, did that for, for many, many years. I uh, went to Colorado State University. I studied finance and real estate there. And I was working in Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, doing accounting work there. And my dad called me one day and he said, hey, I need to hire a property manager. Are you interested? Well, Cheyenne, Wyoming, with all due respect, isn't most fun place to live. So I jumped to that opportunity. And okay. uh, that was about 20 years ago, 20 some odd years ago. So I, I joined the firm permanently at that point in time. And at that time, we were we were relatively small. I think we had, I don't know, 110, 120 doors. And and uh, we've kind of grown slow and steady over the years. So, so today, uh, we've got a, a door count. We do residential and commercial both. Um, we've got just under 1000 doors that we manage. Uh, we do real estate sales. We do property management. We're investors ourselves, so I own some stuff. We we flip. Uh, our mantra is follow the opportunity. Follow the opportunity. So if there's an opportunity in real estate. We want to look at that, uh, whatever that is. So that's that's kind of how we've gotten to where we are today. Got it. Okay. So opportunity. I like to. I, I was just down in uh, Vegas speaking to a group of property managers, and um, they they were bringing up like how how do I avoid all this distraction and, and move the business forward. And what I said to them is opportunity is what I've noticed is what kills entrepreneurs. So how do you keep from following the opportunity at all, mm. all times, but also keeping your focus narrow enough that you're actually moving forward? That's, that's a great question. That's a, that's a really good question. And that, that's hard. That's really hard because we found that the bigger we get, the more successful we get, the more opportunities that are out there. Yeah. And so, so we, we 
at this point, we're kind of of the belief that you've got to say no to almost everything. I think it was Steve Jobs that said, uh, the right. difference between successful people and really successful people are the really successful people say no to just about everything. So following the opportunity as a mantra doesn't mean saying yes to every opportunity. Does not mean saying yes to everything. No, what it means you consider everything, right? I mean, what I don't like is just to be able to say, no, we don't do that. Uh, you know, for many, many years, for example, we didn't do real estate sales. Hey, will you help me sell my house? No, we don't do that. We only do property management. We, we didn't consider it. Well, yeah. and then one day we thought, well, maybe we should consider it. And as we considered it, we realized, hey, this is a, this is a really good opportunity that we should capitalize on. Or when an owner says, gosh, I want to I want to sell my house. Would you guys be interested in buying it? No, we don't do that. We'll, we'll stop saying, no, we don't do that. And at least think about it, consider it. And I think right. that's the, the way to kind of step into some potential opportunities. Uh, but yes, you've got to be cautious or else it gets you pulled in too many directions. That's uh, Yeah, so relevant to that, how many of these uh, units are now in your own portfolio, like are yours or your company's? So within my portfolio, yeah, no, I don't have a real big portfolio. I'm, I'm a pretty conservative guy, so I'm a, I'm a buy it, pay it off kind of guy. Yeah, um, yeah. So I've got, you know, I've got 10, 12 uh, rental properties in my portfolio. Cool. Nice. Okay. So let's, let's get into these five secrets. So uh, the, or five characteristics, not secrets, but these five characteristics that, you know, you feel define a successful company. And you're obviously a successful company. Um, you've helped keep it successful, right? Second generation, and um, and so what? It, let's let's get into number one. Yeah, yeah. And and these, you know, I I don't pretend to be a guru. I can't stand the guys that stand there and beat their chest and you know say do it like me. And I, I know what I'm doing. So this is just from our perspective. We worked with a lot of companies, and and now you know I didn't get into this, but but I do a lot of uh, PM coaching and and business stuff on the side with PM companies, helping them get better basically. And so we, we know a lot of PM companies, we've worked with a lot of PM companies, and there seem to be uh, some, some standards, some things mm -hmm. that, gosh, companies that are successful, however you define success, are going to kind of follow some of these, these aspects. And so this is not meant to be an exhaustive list by any means, uh, but it's a way that we gauge cool. ourselves. This will be cool because I probably come from a very different perspective. You're in the industry, you do this in Denver. And I don't have any rental properties. I don't manage. I'm not a property manager. I've largely been this nerdy fly on the wall that's been able to see inside of hundreds of companies. And so my perspective might be a little bit different, but I'm sure there's some alignment. So let's get into number one. What's All right. Number so, one? So, so number one is successful companies don't take every owner. They don't take every owner that comes along. That's and right. yeah, so you'd agree with that one. <laughs> totally. Yeah. If if anyone's heard my show, they've heard me talk about the cycle of suck, which is mm -hmm. it starts with filtering owners. Like if you don't, if you take on bad owners, you have bad properties. It doesn't matter yes. how amazing they are. And if you have bad properties, you have bad tenants. It doesn't matter how much tenant screening you do. And if you have bad tenants, you have a bad reputation because you have bad owners and bad tenants and nobody's happy. And this is where I think the entire industry as a whole in aggregate sits right now. It has a bad reputation because they're taking on any owner. Yeah, I would agree. Total I would agree with that. And so okay. the, the, the concept is this. Look, any PM company knows that if a tenant, a prospective tenant walks in the door, so an applicant comes in and says, hey, I want to rent your property. Every property manager is a little bit skeptical, right? They raise their eyebrow and they say, okay, well, well maybe I'm going to, I'm going to qualify you. And we know industry-wide that whatever the number is, call it 25, 30, depending on the market you're in, you know, 25, 30% of the applicants are not going to make good tenants. Right? Every, everybody would agree upon that. Well, we really believe that probably that same percentage, 25, 30, 35% of prospective owner clients are not going to make good owner clients. And so the, the challenge comes, well, gosh, how do we filter them? Because if it's an applicant to rent a property, we have them fill out a rental application. We can we, we go in deep, right? I mean, that's the whole hardest part of the business is qualifying those folks. So how do you qualify an owner? That's where the challenge lies. Uh, you know, one thing we do internally, if, a, if you called our office today as a prospective owner client and you were talking uh, to our new account specialist or one of our PMs, they would have a, uh, they'd have a doc in front of them, a piece of paper. And a lot of it's just basic questionnaires, you know, What's your email address? What's the property address? Tell me about the property. But at the end of that questionnaire, then uh, they have four questions, yes or no questions that they have to check the box on, yes or no. They have to discern this information during the conversation uh, with you because it helps us kind of qualify these owners. Okay. And so, so, for example, the first one says, is the owner financially stable? 
Is the owner financially stable? So if during this conversation, you as my prospective owner say to me, uh, you know, hey, Mark, if you can't get this property rented next week, I can't make my mortgage payment. So I've got to get this thing rented quickly. Well, you're not financially stable, right? So, so you, that's going to be a no on that box. That's the right. first Are question. Are you turned on all your house payments? One uh -huh. of my clients said was a favorite question they would ask. Yes, it, yes. No, it's instant disqualification. Absolutely, absolutely. And then the second question we have to ask ourselves is, is the client emotionally stable? <laughs> and that can, be, that can be a hard one to discern. I, I always tell people, look, don't ask them the question verbatim, okay? That'll <laughs> Get you in you, trouble. Uh, are you saying yes? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But we need to be able to discern that information from the conversation. Is gosh, is this somebody who's going to be stable when things go bad? Because at some point in time, it will. Right. I mean, sometimes people will reveal their their emotional instability pretty quickly. Right? Yes. Yeah. I, I tell my my PMs, look, I mean, two quick keys: if they cry on the first conversation, or if they own more than two cats, they're just not emotionally stable. Run away from them. So. <laughs> It might be a little biased against cat owners. <laughs> well, some cat owners like anyway. I know you just lost half of your audience there with cat owners, but my personal <laughs> bias. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, cool. I am as well. I'm as well. And then the third question we ask is, uh, can I control the situation and the client? Like, are they willing to give me control? Not in a you know puppet master. I'm going to be the mean guy, but they've got to give me control. They've got to be willing to do so. And then question number four is, are they realistic in expectations? So our PMs have to check the yes or no box in every one of those. And what we tell them is, look, if you can't check yes on each of those four questions, not only do I not say want you working with again. Them, Sorry, say the last question again. Are they realistic in their expectations? Oh, okay, got are it. Realistic? Are they realistic? So, okay. so in other words, you know, do they think that, uh, that we should be able to get $2,000 a month for a property that's only going for 1000 or do they think that we should call them before we ever spend a dime on maintenance? That's just not realistic. That's not going to happen. So yeah. if we can't check the yes box on all four of those, then my PM does not have permission to work with that client. I love the idea of figuring out if they're willing to relinquish control. I mean, that's, a, that's such a big thing because they're coming to you to solve a problem. And I think during the sales conversation, if you just, and I think sometimes it's proper, I've noticed with clients that they're not willing to be strong enough of a fence for people to push against to elicit trust enough for people to relinquish that control. I think a lot of people will push, they might look like bad owners, they're trying to test the fence and they're just really, it's kind of like in dating how girls will kind of crap test a guy. They just want to see if they can handle handle them or if they're willing to like be strong enough. And I think a lot of times property managers will try to be nice. They maybe don't have enough bite or drive and they're really looking for somebody they can feel safe with. And so they test us. So I think, I think clients will test us and I think then they're willing to relinquish control. And at times, it's just something I've noticed, like during the sales process, because I deal with entrepreneurs, they're driven people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I need the same thing. They need to be willing to relinquish a certain amount of control because I'm asking them to do crazy stuff like fire doors or change their business name, you know. And so, um, yeah, so I, I love that idea. And then are they realistic in their expectations? If somebody says, hey, I want to add 500 doors in the next quarter, you know, then <laughs> that's probably not going to be realistic. And so I want to make sure that they're in touch with a reality that I feel I can, can give them or lead them towards. And uh, it's the same with, with our clients, you know, property management clients. Yep. Yep. And if we set those filters on the front end, that's just going to make things so much easier on bringing mm -hmm. good clients on because our business is hard enough without having difficult owner clients. Uh, but I think this, the second aspect of that is, well, gosh, you know, say, well, that, that's, that's great. I wish I would have heard that before I took on Mr. Crazy, right? So, so what do you do then? And I think the other part of that, and you, you alluded to this, is sometimes you do need to let those clients go. And sometimes that, that's the best thing because we're talking about what successful companies do, right? Successful companies realize that, hey, if we made a mistake, we brought on a bad client, we need to let that client go, whatever that looks like. There's always going to be those mistakes. Like we, we cannot always know and perceive every person coming in and know that they are emotionally stable or that you can control them or that you, they will be realistic. But when they start to reveal those, those colors, we have to be willing to let them go. And, um, I've made bad decisions, you know, in bringing people in as clients and I, I have had to let them go. And uh, some of them were just really like 
like verbally abusive to my team. I mean, you'd be really amazed at some of the type of people that that can somehow leak through, even if you have pretty good qualifications at the beginning. But I love what you're getting getting at here because I mean, really anybody that's studied sales in any capacity knows that qualifying a prospect is at the outset. And so it's really kind of mind boggling that people would not qualify their prospects in any regard. And yeah. So, so I'm know. curious, you, you said, you know, you've had a lot of people uh, like clients go, how have you overcome the internal thought of, Ooh, but that's like, that's money, right? I mean, that's, that's a big chunk. Where do you, when do you decide, how do you decide? Is that an internal struggle for you? Um, sometimes, I mean, there's, there's always a negotiation and it's a balance. It's a balance between the, the money aspect and the, the, the cost with the team. Ultimately my team, I want to keep forever. I want to keep them long-term. And so if I keep that client on, I'm saying to my team, your feelings don't matter. I don't care about you. And that sends a really painful message. And I've noticed this in property management companies. People wonder why there's so much turnover at, with their staff. And I think one key reason is because you're allowing your staff, you're forcing your staff to tolerate too much. And there's some of these owners that should be let go. And I've said many times to clients, the hallmark of a seasoned property manager is that they've fired some clients. Some businesses have hundreds of doors and they've never fired a client. And they, they're, and I know, I know if they're, if they've never fired a client, they have some bad things in their portfolio. They've, there's some pain there and that's a difficult place to work. It's a difficult place to work. It is. It, and it's, it's hard right? to let go of painful situations. And there's always going to be painful situations. Yep. And I've, I've never talked to a PM who did let a client go who regretted it. Right? I mean, it's, it's hard. Yeah. It's, it's scary. Uh, we, we faced that. I, I remember very vividly when we were small and I don't know, we had 125 doors maybe. And we had a mm -hmm. client and he had like 12 properties. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I mean, I, I remember the guy, I could see the guy's face and he wasn't a yes. bad guy, mm -hmm. but oh, he was just difficult. And he, it, it had to be jumping. his way. He would contact us all the time. He just drove us crazy. And we just, mm -hmm. we finally decided we need to let the guy go. Well, that was like 10% of our portfolio. You know, yeah. 10, that was hard. Oh, that we, we, we just, we thought about it. We didn't know what to do. And even after we did it, we thought, oh, is that the right decision or, or not? But we quickly realized, wow, what a, it's like a load has been lifted, right? I mean, when you get rid of those people that suck that, that time and energy and life out of you, it is a positive thing. The operational costs, the emotional costs, like when all of that falls by the wayside, I've never had a client fire some uh, uh, something. I had one person fire half their portfolio. It was like one big property. I, I had one person do that and they were terrified, but they, they did it. And it, uh, the two things happen almost every time. One, they replace the income really quickly. It always, it creates some sort of vacuum in the universe. I don't know what you want to call it, but um, it, all, they always seem to replace the income really mm -hmm. quickly with better doors. That always seems to happen. They just need to trust that that's going to happen. The other thing is, is they always say to me, I can't believe I didn't do it sooner. Like they wish they had done it sooner. Yep. They were so afraid of doing it. And then once they do it, they realize it wasn't so bad. And they wish they're like, why didn't I do this sooner? So if somebody, if one of your clients is talking to you and you're saying, Hey, you need to fire this owner. How do you recommend they do that? Like what, what should they say? Should they say you're, you're interviewing you're fired? Me now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's a few ways you can let them go. There's some creative ways. One of the best is just raise the fees. Like if, if it's, if you Peter, whether it's make it worth it, just make it more expensive. Say, Hey, we're, we're this property is difficult. You're a bit more challenging for us to deal with, to be honest. We're, we're, we're willing to keep doing it, but it's going to cost X. And so you just raise the rate. And if they keep being annoying and you feel like it's still not worth it, you keep raising the rate till they self select themselves out. That's one easy way. Another way is to just refer them to somebody else. And if you're going to refer, you might as well get a nice referral fee out of it. So go to one of your buddies and one man's junk is another man's treasure. I mean, they might know how to deal with this type of person. They might be a better personality fit for this type of person than you. So don't, don't just instantly assume that because you can't tolerate them or they're difficult for you, that everybody else will give them to somebody else and let somebody else have a shot. You know, so those, Good, are, yeah. those are a couple I like of ways. It. I like it. Yeah. We will, we will rarely fire an owner, but we will, as you just suggested, 
bump fees up and up and up until they decide to fire us. I'd much rather have them fire us and, and leave on their terms. Right. They, they'll self-select. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, okay, cool. So are we complete on number one? Number I think two? so. I think so. So number two is successful companies know their numbers. They know their numbers. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I see this so often with PM companies is they get, we get really good at the, the logistical side of, we know how to lease, we know how to talk to owners, we know how to collect rent. But when it comes to the numbers, the financials, we just don't know what we're doing oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And and I really am a big believer in that concept that, you know, if, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. You don't know how well your business is doing. Um, one, one question I'll often ask of, of coaching clients that I work with uh, on that side of things is I'll say, okay, now when do you, so if, if you, Jason, own a PM company, I would say, when, at what point in time, Jason, do you close the books for your company? So let's say the month of June ends, right? We're, we're here almost to the end of June. When June closes for you, how quickly will you have your June books closed so that you know how much money your company made in the month of June? And, and the answers always surprise me, right? I mean, they're all over the board. Well, I'm, I'm currently 90 days behind. I'm, I'm trying to catch up or I'm, I'm much further behind than that. Or I might get it to it towards yeah. the end of the following month. And Yeah, how can uh, they make know. business decisions if they're how looking 90 days in the rearview mirror? That's, yes. Imagine trying yeah. to drive a car like that. My favorite day of the month for, like I said, I've been doing this for many, many years. And, and while we were small, like like anybody else, I was everything. Right? I was, the, I was the, the, the janitor and I was the accountant and I was everything. My favorite day of the month was always the, the first. Not because we'd collect rents, but because on the first day of the month, I'd go online and I'd print out the bank statement, like our company bank statement for the last month, and I'd get our paper checkbook out and I'd reconcile and I'd get our ending balance and I'd enter it all into QuickBooks and I could look at that piece of paper and say, hey, how much money did we make last month? Like, I, I love that. I love, I would wake up early to do that. And I'm, I'm weird, I know, but, but, I, but that's how you know how well you're doing. And I wouldn't wait until the second, the third, the fourth, the 20th. That's crazy. So you can do it on the first. So I, I'm a big believer in as soon as possible, which in this day and age, it can be pretty much immediate. You sure. get your books balanced, you run some numbers and you see how your company is doing it. And you track some, some metrics, some internal metrics for your company to know how you're doing. Yeah, I think um, I think the challenge is when property managers are holding on to something that's not in their particular wheelhouse or area of genius. But this is very if this isn't your thing, if you're not like Mark and you don't love doing this and this isn't like what makes you thrilled and excited is to get into your bank statements and numbers, have somebody else get everything ready for you. I mean, I've got a profit first coach and accountant. She tells me she meets with me and goes over everything with me and I get like not only my perspective, but she says, this is what it looks like to me, you know, Jason. So yeah, I think it's, it's hugely helpful to do a review every month and look yeah. at your numbers. And, and like you just said, m most folks aren't as weird as I am, as it comes to that stuff. And that, that's fine, but yeah, you need to find weird. someone that gets excited. Oh, I'm very weird, but you need to find someone weird like me, right? You need to find someone who can go get excited about running your numbers and make sure they do it. And then you review those and, and you track a couple key metrics and, and some of those, like for example, some of the metrics that we always track um, are door count proportional to owner count because that's okay. a sign of a healthy business. So for example, if, if you've got a, if you're a company with a hundred doors, if you've got a hundred owners for those hundred doors, that is the sign of a very healthy business because it means that you don't have too much, you don't have any one owner with too much control versus the guy that called me, I, I had a guy called me a couple weeks ago and he wanted to know if I was interested in buying his business. So well, tell me a little bit about it. And, and I think he had like 75 doors. And I've got 75 doors. I'm here in Denver and interested in selling. And, and one of the first questions I always ask is, well, how many owner clients do you yeah. have? If he had 75 two? doors. <laughs> four. He had four. Yeah, four. Okay. I was like, oh, you know what? Like, so I, I don't need to know anything else. I don't need to. I'm not interested. Why? Because if we took those doors on, that's, that's, that's four owners with a lot of control. So yeah, ideally if you lost two of them, then, <laughs> yeah. you know, what, what are you getting? Yeah. Yeah. And some so, that you can't control, but you need to, tr to track it. That's one of the things you want to track uh, on a regular basis. Um, another metric we really like to track is the percentage of our overall income that we spend on employees because that, mm -hmm. in, in our industry, that again, can just be all over the map oh, uh, yeah. on, on companies. And it, do you have a, uh, do you have a number on that that you recommend to your, your folks on what that number should be? Uh, you know, it varies so wildly, especially by market. Um, but uh, I've heard some, I've heard some amazing situations in which one, I, I know an owner that 
has seven sixty five percent profit margin in his business. Wow. I know it's That's, ridiculous. And it's he's got a couple down. hundred yeah. doors. I know. Mm. I know. So, I mean, it varies so wildly and it, it depends largely on the type of owners they're taking on mm -hmm. the type of properties because one bad owner, I talk about this in the cycle of suck idea very often, but if you take one bad owner or one bad door property ha can have 10 times, maybe even a hundred times the operational cost as a good door. And so that can vary so wildly, but yeah, I've had, I've, I had a company come to me that had 500, six, five, 600 units under management and wasn't making a dime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said, how is this possible? And they're like, well, we're doing 3 mil a month in real estate. So they, there was a brokerage with a cancerous tumor on the side called property management. And he, he, he had like twice as much staff as he needed, no technology in place. Fast forward, he fired half his team. He fired about 200 doors, maybe 300 doors. And the, it's now a very profitable company. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not all about doors and staffing mm -hmm. is always going to be the highest cost. Right. And if you can replace even a fraction of that or create some leverage for your team using technology, outsourcing, whatever, uh, those are some big wins financially. Yeah. And a lot of times everyone's looking at, I got to get more revenue in and they're not looking at their expenses. That's why I'm a big fan of the profit first system, which says you're, you take out a portion for profit and then what's left over is your expenses. Most people yeah. are like expenses, you know, you, you, you just revenue minus expenses and then whatever's left over, there's nothing left over typically in that situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. We have that, that profit is almost like an expense item that we know we're going to take that out every month and put it into a savings exactly. account. We've been doing that, doing that for a, a long, long time from that aspect. But yes, I, I agree a hundred percent with the that aspect of what you're saying there. The, uh, the number that we kind of coach folks around is you don't want to go over 50% of your total revenue to staffing costs, regardless of your size. And, and the bigger you get, the more that number's gonna probably creep towards that just because you get more overhead and you get more managers and you have more uh, more red tape. So that's that's a, that's a natural part of that. But if you go over 50, that's that's a red alert. Something's wrong. Something's wrong from that standpoint. So that's, uh, that's an important number to track for every company. Yeah, and as companies scale, they, they're able to create a bit more leverage. But yeah, I could see how when you're really small and you're doing everything, your costs, your employee costs are a bit less per door, right? Because you're kind of check, you know, assuming your free labor. Or maybe mm -hmm. if you uh, work for your dad <laughs> and your right. free slave labor, or sometimes it's a spouse, you know, they'll bring in, they'll have their spouse as their business partner, and you'll see them get to maybe. 70 80 units and they're tapped out and they can't afford to hire their first person nobody's getting paid you know so mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense all right so i like it so um anything else on number two knowing the numbers uh the only things other things i would just add like that's worth tracking that i often find companies don't track this well enough is how many doors they're adding and how many doors they're losing that, that's just that's oh, always yeah. a surprise to me is when you ask them that they'll say well i could i could dig it up but but i don't know because uh, a lot of the softwares don't track that I mean, we're old school, like we've, we've got the spreadsheet, right? So every time we lose a door, we go to our, our spreadsheet for the year and we put it in and it's going to keep that auto tracking. Every time we sign a new one up, it goes on the spreadsheet. So we can, we can pull that up and instantly see, okay, as of right now, we've lost X number of doors per this per year and we've added X number of doors per year. So, so, so track that, don't make that something that uh, you've got to go dig and dig and dig in your software and try to pull a report. That needs to be one of those metrics that you're tracking at least on a monthly basis. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a pretty difficult situation. It's a common one where you'll see somebody adding a door and losing a door just as often. And mm -hmm. they wonder why they're not getting growth. And the, the, sometimes the problem isn't aren't getting enough on. It's retaining doors. And it could be the type of target audience that they're going after. It could be that they are lacking some awareness around how to retain these clients or, or whatever it might be. But yeah, that's an important thing, I think, to, to pay attention to. Yeah. yeah, and to track the percentage of doors lost, right? I mean, that's all over the map as well. Um, and, and we coach folks, I mean, the ideal is if you can keep your losses on an annual basis in the single digits from a percentage standpoint, that's pretty good. So if you can keep it you know, 10% or below on doors that are leaving you every year, you're, you're in a pretty rare group of PMs. 
So one of the, uh, so I created something for property managers called our cold leads calculator. So one of the things I noticed with a lot of companies, and this is more relevant to what I do, but um, I noticed a lot of property managers are not paying attention to the amount of money that they're spending on cold lead marketing, pay-per-click SEO, um, you know, um, APM leads, you know, all these different places, uh, social media marketing, content marketing that they're paying to generate business. And uh, because a bulk of where most people get their deals and leads from, I find in the industry is often word of mouth. So they just group everything together, all their warm leads from word of mouth and referrals and all their cold lead marketing, and they're not paying attention. And when you look at the numbers alone of the cold lead marketing, which everyone can check it out by going to doorgrow.com slash cold leads, they can take this you know, little questionnaire and go through it, but it'll help you calculate your costs for cold lead marketing. It also calculates and factors into time. Time is worth money and it calculates and asks what that time is worth. Like what's your hourly wage or whoever's following up on these, how much time does it take to follow up on these to create a real aggregate or at least close aggregate cost of what one cold lead is costing you. And I've seen numbers. I just had one come through the other day. One cold lead was costing them $5,000. I've seen $11,000. I've seen uh, $1,700 per lead. And so, um, or per, per acquisition per deal. And so the, and what I love to ask them when I get them on the phone, I say, Hey, I saw you fill out this cold lead thing. How long is it going to take you? How long does it take you to recoup $5,000, you know, on a contract? And they're like, well, that's probably like, you know, three years of free management or two years, you know, whatever. And so um, then they, their perspective starts to shift and we have to uncouple, uncouple that. So yeah, the transparency in numbers helps you make decisions as a business owner. Yep. yep. And then review them, review them regularly. Don't just leave it to your accountant. But if you're, if you're a successful PM company, you're, you're looking at those numbers because those numbers make a difference. All right. We're on to number three. All right, number three is kind of a good lead in as you were just talking about there. So number three would be successful companies focus on profit, not door count. Focus on profit, right. not door count. And and you, you've you already talked about this. I mean, this comes up so often in our industry. What's the first question any PM asks another PM? Is, well, how many doors your door, do you have? How many doors do you have? What's your door count? How many doors are you managing, right? That, that's that's yeah. the measuring stick and it's the wrong measuring stick because I, I know companies that are smaller uh, that are very profitable. And I know companies mm-hmm. that are very large that are not profitable at all. So, so yeah. the door count is irrelevant. The profit is what matters. And yeah. what that means is, practically speaking, if you've got 50 doors, I would say before you say, oh, I, need, I need another 50. Well, that's fine. But you know what? Let's maximize the profit on the, on the existing group you have. And that doesn't mean just go out and nickel and dime everybody. But it means what other services can you provide? What other things mm-hmm. can you put in place to make sure that you're maximizing that income? And that'll have a, a dual impact in that you're going to increase your income on the, on that 50. And then when you pick up your next 50, now you've already got some structures in place to ensure that they're profitable as well. So you, we've got to focus on on the profit, on the, on the revenue streams uh, to be successful. Absolutely. I don't think there's ever been a property management company that I've seen that is not leaving some money on the table. There's always additional services that you can offer, even if it's something little like you know, filter easy or pet screening.com, you know, there's, there's always some additional value that you can offer. And there's always usually a way you can monetize that people are willing mm-hmm. to pay for additional value. So yeah, love it. And, and, over, uh, account, totally and on, the, on the flip side of that as well, I think we need to pay attention to those expenses, right? Because mm-hmm. the industry right now, I think is, is more difficult than it's been in a long time. Um, and folks that have not been in the industry for too long don't recognize this because this is normal to them. But this it's a tough industry right now. This is a tough market for, to be running a property management company. And when things get tough, you've got to be tight on expenses. And, and it's, it's too easy not to get tough on expenses. So yeah. you know that's one thing we encourage folks to do is go through that profit and loss line by line by line. And if there are expense items on there that are not directly relational to income coming in, you got to figure out how to cut them. You've got to get rid of those wasteful expenses. And that is such a good exercise to sit down and start going through that stuff and say, well, gosh, I've just been paying for this subscription service every month and I don't even know what it does. I signed up for it two years ago. All right, let's get that canceled because that's that's, exactly. It's just as beneficial as as getting on on a new door is cutting those expenses. And, um, you know, oftentimes, 
<laughs> Go ahead. This, this is why I love having a profit first coach because this this mm -hmm. really is built into the system. And she every month is like, hey, what about these services? You said you were going to cancel. What do you, you said you didn't need this anymore? And so yeah, so I think it's helpful if if that's not your if you're not like accounting minded. I highly recommend you go back and watch my episode with Mike Michalowicz, who's the author of Profit First, and check out that episode. I think it was a fantastic episode. Really cool guy came and spoke at our conference. And um, but yeah, it it covers that system, like cutting down expenses, putting profit first, making sure that expenses are fitting within your your existing budget, and you're still getting a profit. Yeah, makes sense. And and, and what I had to do. I realized that the biggest expense item, the biggest overhead we had was my ego, right? The things that, that, that I wanted for me, the big desk, the big office, the nice car, right? And that's, that's something that everyone needs to start there, right? Because uh, if you drive them yeah. into any, especially on the real estate sales side, right? you go to any real estate sales event, you know, what is the parking lot filled with? A lot of very expensed leased vehicles. And I'm not against nice vehicles, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but man, that's just a suck on the income. Uh, side of things. Yeah, I think um, there's always this ratio between the amount of money that you're going to take out of the business and the amount of money that you're going to leave in to fund towards growth. And if we take out too much too quickly, the business is growth is stagnated. And I've seen some really aggressive companies put almost all of their money. I've seen owners like try not to even take a paycheck, you know, like they're really minimizing their, their takeout of the business so that they could fund the growth because they're they're delaying gratification for the future. They're funding and creating a business that is growing and they're putting their, their funds and their money towards that. And sometimes you have to double down as a business owner and be willing to take a short-term hit because you want a long-term growth goal. So. Agreed. And we can put too much, like we can put too much towards growth to where it feels shaky. It feels unsafe. We're not holding anything back. There's no padding there. And so it really is this balance of how much do, am I going to put towards growth and be aggressive and how much, am, how safe am I going to play it and how stable and slow am I going to be at doing this? And yeah, yeah, so there's, there's a balance there. It is a balance. It's an absolute balance. Cause yes, you do need to leave some in and, and you need to be pulling some out every month and putting it in that savings account so that you have opportunities. I mean, we've purchased several uh, companies over the years and every one of those deals worked because we were able to, in essence, say, hey, we can write a check. Let's, we'll write a check today. We'll get this deal done. Why? Because we have money put away so that yeah. that savings account isn't just comforting. It's, mm -hmm. it's an opportunity fund for things when that come up in the future. Yeah, like it. All right, is that three? That's three. All right, number four. So number four, successful companies have systems and follow them. They have systems in place and they follow them. And, and the word systems you know, means different things to different people. Some people sure. think, well, that's just, so I just need a, I need a good software. Like, you know, what's the system? And mm -hmm. I really believe that probably 75 to 80% of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in our industry can be systematized, meaning simply documenting your process, documenting your routine, because it plays out in so many ways. We learned this early on when, when we were growing and there was, first there was two of us, right? My dad and I, we both did it all. And then we hired a third person and then we all three did it all. And then we hired a fourth person. And by the time we hired that fourth person, we realized that, you know, we can't all do it all. This isn't scalable. We can't mm -hmm. all do everything and it works great at two people. It works great at three people, but when we have that number four person and, and Mr. Tennant calls in and says, Hey, I called in with a maintenance request last week and I haven't heard from anybody. And I say, Oh, well, well do you know who you talked to? Uh, no, I don't remember. Well, well, hold on. Let me see if I can figure out, Hey, hey dad, did they talk to you? Hey, Bill, did they talk to you? Sue, did they talk to you? No, they talked to one of us, right? Well, that's very ineffective. So you've got to start kind of specializing in your processes. And so we realized at that point in time that, gosh, you know what, if we're going to hire someone to be our leasing person, for example, we better have a documented process for them to follow. And I mean, specific, detailed, documented, you know, mm -hmm. here's, here's what time you get to the property before showing you open the door, you turn on the lights. Here's where you stand when they come in. Here's how you greet them. Here's what you say. Here's what you don't say. Here's how you process an application. And if we do that in, in our entire business and we break the business down into the smallest components, it, it simplifies things like like nothing else because we're in a complex business. Right? So so we, we think of kind of a, if you think of a continuum in your mind, right? That, that long line going in both directions. And on, on one side of the continuum, you have the words uh, consistency, 
and simplicity, right? Consistency and simplicity. And on the other side, the far extreme opposite, you've got the words variation and complexity, variation, complexity. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself, where, where am I on that continuum? And we're all different places, but we hopefully want to always be moving more t towards consistency and simplicity. And, and I don't think there's a better way of doing that than through documenting your process, your system, uh, and then following it, training on it, mm -hmm. up, improving it, upgrading it. And it, it's got to be written. It's got to be documented. And it, it's a process. And it needs to be used. And, and it needs to be part. used. That was the, I mean, that was the second people part. document right? it. They'll give it to the team member. The team member will look at it the first few times they do it, and then they're done. And so there's no, and that I had Process Street on as a guest once, and we use Process Street internally, but it forces them to actually use the process ongoing. It's, yep. it's you know, it's a checklist that has to be yes. verified and completed. Yeah. Yep. Check, uh, checklists are huge, right? I mean, our, mm -hmm. our, we couldn't exist without the checklist and it, it's old school, but it yeah. works, you know, and we still have, we still have paper checklists on some things in our office here. And then people say, well, you know, that's, that wouldn't work. I guess just too old school. And I said, well, you know what? It, it, we're pretty successful. We've got a, it works for a thousand doors. I can tell you that it will work but beyond that. I don't know, but it works to get you to a thousand. There you go. So yeah, I've noticed in businesses, I think there's, I mean, minimum, probably seven systems that every business eventually has to have in, in a business. One, they have to have an internal communication system. For me, my team's virtual, so we're using things like Basecamp, Voxer, you know, stuff like that. But there needs to be an internal communication system that isn't just, hey, Steve, did you do this? Right. So there needs to be internal communication. There needs to be a process documentation system. That could just be Google Sheets and doc, Docs and whatever, or it could be something more complicated or, or cooler like Process Street or whatever. But there needs to be a process documentation system. There needs to be a billing system, of course. You know, property managers will use maybe Appfolio or, you know, Rentec Direct or, you know, whatever, build them. But um, there needs to be some sort of billing accounting system. And then there needs to be a support system. So a lot of property managers are starting to gravitate towards setting up Help Scout or Intercom or Drift or, you know, one of these. But the, um, internally, we use Intercom. There needs to be a support system in the business so that you can track tickets and track things. And sometimes you'll do that through your property management software a bit. Um, I find one system most property management businesses are lacking or missing is a planning system. And so you're hearing people move towards traction in some of this, which I think has some fundamental flaws to be blunt, but it's a great system. It's better than no system. And there's a lot of systems out there for planning, but there needs to be a planning system in the business. And um, another system that's necessary, I think, is a sales CRM. This is different than your existing customer database. This is for prospects. There needs to be a sales CRM in place. A lot of property managers use Lead Simple, for example. And then if there were one other system you could throw in, there'd probably be a phone system, right? So we need some mm -hmm. way to manage this big influx of calls or outbound calls or teams, team members being able to be reached. But, yeah. um, yep. you know, so these are some of the systems that I've paid attention to that businesses kind of need. And most businesses will have maybe two or three. Yep. And, and we, we preach, well, we practice as well as preach, um, to make like the, on the systems for individual team members to make them position specific. Right. So, mm. so we have, you know, we've got, I don't know, 20 some odd people in our office and every role has a, a position specific system manual. So our director of accounting so. has a director of accounting system manual. I'm, I'm the president of the organization. I have a president system manual. Why? because I need to be replaceable. And that's one of the benefits of it, mm -hmm. right? That idea that now we become less dependent upon individuals and no individual can hold us hostage to be like, ah, oh, they've got everything in their head. Like what, what are we gonna do if they leave? That's we can't scary. lose them. That's a terrible place to be. Well, we don't have to worry about that because if you know everyone, you're gonna lose everybody at some point in time. You'll either lose them for a good reason or a bad reason, but they need to be replaceable. And if you have a document, if you have documented their process, then they become replaceable, unreplaceable. If, if I get hit by the truck today, it's all right. Or, or hopefully the company will take a little hit. Hopefully they need me a little bit. But, <laughs> but we've got a system manual that somebody yeah. can step into that role and already says, hey, this is what Mark does. Just do it and, and you'll be successful. Yeah, I like it. All right. So are we on to five? Number five, so the last one, uh, successful companies recruit and develop talent. Recruit and develop talent. So you know, we just talked about systems and the concept that systems can make your people replaceable to some extent, and, and they should. However, at the end of the day, the team with the best players usually wins, right? And, mm -hmm. and so if you can go out there and if you can figure out how to recruit the best talent and then retain them, that is going to do more for your company than almost anything else out there. 
And, and that's just, that's one thing that I, if I'm going to brag about something about our company, I'll brag about that. We get the best people around. We're just, we've gotten good at that. And oh, it makes it so much easier to do business. You know, I, I don't work harder than my competitors. I, I don't. I'm not smarter than my competitors. I don't, I, I'm not technological, tech, I can't even say it, technologically savvy more than my competitors. I'm not. But what we do better than a lot of our competitors is we get really good people. Now that's hard. And it's hard to get really good people. And that's why I say you got to recruit. It doesn't mean you put an ad on Craigslist and uh, read a bunch of resumes of people that can't get jobs. It means you, right. you go out and you find people that are really good at what they do and you got to get them. You got to recruit them. That's hard because successful people aren't looking for jobs. There are, they're already successful. Yeah. But if you want to be successful, you've got to go out there. So we, you know, I, I tell the story and I'll, I'll give you the, the short version, but we had to um, hire a leasing person not too long ago. And uh, we were, we were hiring, meaning we were just reviewing resumes. And I thought this, this is ridiculous. We can't find anybody good. I better do what I told myself I should be doing. So I, I got my car one day and I drove around to a lot of the multifamily class A properties in Denver. And I, and I walked in as a prospect. Hey, I'm, I'm Mark. I'm here. Just want to see what you had available. I'm looking for a buddy of mine uh, to rent a property. And I was usually met with, the, you know, okay, well, here, here's a piece of paper. Uh, tell your buddy to give us a call. I'd say, okay. And I, and I would left. Well, about the fourth place I came to, I, I came in and met a gal there behind the front. And, and I said, oh, Mark, I'm just looking for a place for a buddy of mine. She said, well, well, tell me about your buddy. So, well, he's looking for uh, one bedroom. He's tall, dark, and handsome. Uh, got a cat. Probably crazy. <laughs> And uh, she's like, you know what? I think I know the perfect. I know the perfect unit for your buddy. Do you have a couple minutes? Because I'd love to just have you tour this this property. Yeah, sure, okay. So she tours me through, and, and like, and she's pointing out the feature benefit stuff. I mean, she was sharp. She was sharp. And uh, I said, I said, you know, her name is Lindsay. I, like I said, this. Lindsay. Yeah. I said, Lindsay, you are really good at your job. You are. Really, oh, I love leasing. I just, I love it. I love helping people. I love real estate. I just, I love what I do. And I said, uh, that that's that's great. You know, um, coincidentally. I uh, happen to run a property management company, and we're actually looking to hire a director of leasing for residential real estate. Have you ever thought about doing residential? Because she was a multifamily, and she's like, "Oh no, no, I, I, I could never leave. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a job hopper. Like, I'm really stable. Stability is a big deal for me. Once I get somewhere, I like to stay. Well, now yeah. I'm drooling, right? I'm like, oh, stability. Oh, we got to have her. And I said, well, is, is there anything you don't like about your job? And I said, oh, well, you know, we work weekends. <laughs> we work weekends. I said, oh, yeah, that's, that's too bad. You know, uh, we, we don't work weekends. <laughs> yeah. No, I want to work weekends. I said, tell you what, let tell you what. Why don't you come into my office sometime? Would you, here's my card. I'd love just to sit down and have a conversation with you. Who knows? Maybe something comes out of it. Maybe something don't. But I'd love to just connect and, and see if there's something there for the future. Well, yeah. long story short, we got her. We got Lindsay, right? And we had to get, like, we had to go after her. We had to get her. Mm -hmm. She did, she kind of didn't want to leave. She's been a rock star. She's been amazing the things that she's helped our company to do. But we wouldn't have found her if we were just hiring. Like we had to go recruit her. We had to go get her. So that's what you've got to do in every position in your company. you got to go find stuff. And I'm not saying you know go steal people away from your competitors, but you've got to find those people out there that are successful and get them. And then once you get them, you got to retrain them, uh, retain them. So you got to train them well. you got to pay them well, which is another reason you need to have good profit because good people aren't cheap. Right? Yeah. But that's what's going to lead to a long-term success. And it lets you take a step back out of the day-to-day -day stuff at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, a, a lot of people, and I think it's important to point out what, what you're saying is not that people are easily replaceable, that you can pop somebody else in. You're not saying that at all. Um, and I think every business owner knows that if you have a seasoned team member that you've invested in, that you've trained, that you've developed, there's nothing as good as that. Like having somebody that's been with you for years, I, I have a team member that's been on my team for, gosh, I don't know, maybe six years and, and he's a rock star. And I have a competitive advantage over most companies in that I really, um, our team's virtual, so I can source the best talent from anywhere pretty much in the world. And, um, but yeah, if it, this can be challenging for property managers that are looking for somebody locally, they're looking for somebody nearby, they're mm -hmm. looking for a particular set of skills maybe. Um, but ultimately, yeah, if you find somebody good, you want to make sure you retain them and that you keep them, them, keep them happy. And because it's, I don't know, you can compare it to the wine, you can compare it to anything, but over time they just get better. If yeah. they're good, they get better. If they're not good, they get worse.
And that's the, that's the other side of the coin, right? That's where, just like we talked about earlier with owners, so which is what we started this whole conversation with on, if you get a bad owner, what should you do? You need to let them go. Well, if you make a hiring mistake, you need to fix that and correct that as well and let that yeah. person go because we're going to make hiring mistakes. We, we are that. very good at this, but we make a lot of hiring mistakes. We just do, I, it drives me crazy. But when we do that, we correct it quickly. So we're gonna, we're gonna move that person on very quickly uh, when we make that mistake. Why? Because the longer they're sitting there, the longer the right person isn't there. So you've gotta make that, mis- make that correction when you've made a hiring mistake. Yeah, I think it's amazing when you bring on a new team member, it changes the entire team. Mm-hmm. And it either changes the entire team for the better or for the worse, especially if that team member that you just brought on is taking off of your plate anything. It changes your role as CEO. It changes your role as entrepreneur, and it affects everything that you know, everything from you. And so, yeah, I think um, it's pretty significant. It's pretty significant, mm-hmm. and it's important to make sure that they're right fit. But we've we're all going to make hiring mistakes, like we all do. You have to kiss a few frogs, and um, you have to suck a little bit at hiring in order to get find the good people. It's an art, and, and the, the skill set to hire someone no in no way translates over to property management. So it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm a good at property manager. I'll obviously be good at hiring. No, there's no correlation there. It's completely different. And, and the other unfortunate thing is the smaller your company is, the more important it is to make that first good hire. You know, we've, got, we've got 20 people. If we make a bad hire, we've got one in 20 then who's bad, right? So they, they can fly under the radar a little bit. They're not going to sink the company. But if we've got two people, and then we make a bad hire for number three. So we've now got 33% of our workforce that's a low performer. So the smaller you are, the more important it is that you take the time, get the right person in. And a lot of it is just time, right? You've got to slow down the hiring process. These, these ideas of, oh, you know, well, well we, we had a phone conversation and we interviewed them. I mean, isn't that enough? No, are you kidding me? No. You want to do multiple interviews. Anybody can come across as a positive person on that first interview. You want to have multiple interviews with multiple people. You got to dig, dig, dig on that before you make that job offer. Yeah. I think um, where I've made a lot of mistakes personally in the hiring process is I love to delegate and it's delegating too quickly. I think the onboarding process is so critical that if um, one of the biggest mistakes, some people will micromanage, they'll control too much. And I think, and some people will do the opposite. They'll bring somebody on and they won't give them all the training, all the tools, all the support they need to really be the rock star they could have been. And so that's, you know, so I've made both of those mistakes, you know, to be transparent. So I think onboarding is a really important process to make sure you're meeting with your new hires on a regular basis, daily initially, and then backing it off to weekly and, and so on. So that every day, like, where are you stuck? What do you need? What are you confused about? Because often they're not going to just volunteer all that information to you. But when you're meeting with them daily, they're going to feel supported. They're going to feel like they're invested in the team. And I think yeah. onboarding is a really big deal. That's where I've made, that's where I've made mistakes. So mm-hmm. we, we still do one-on-one meetings every single week, every week, with every one of our team members. So it doesn't matter how long they've been here. I mean, that I'm a huge believer in that being a, a I guess if, I want, if you wanted number six, <laughs> there's number six, right? Have one on ones. Meet with your team. Meet one on ones every single week. Sitting down with them, even if it's for five or ten minutes, uh, to touch base, see what issues are going on. Those have been uh, critical for for our people and their success. So I'm curious though. What so uh, we got a bonus number. You got a bonus so number six on. because because Free you're so good. Mark. What uh, what did I leave out? I'm curious. What what do you you talk to a lot of PM companies? What do you think are characteristics of success? Maybe that. Uh, Oh man, that, that we didn't hit on. I, did, I wasn't even thinking this. I was so into yours. Um, okay, so um, no, I think all of these things are really fantastic. I think um, I think if I were to add a seventh here that I think is absolutely critical. That um, so imagine you have an org chart, you're at the top, and this is like a reservoir of hopefully money and or water or whatever you want to want, want to call it. And there's outflow. You're paying your team, you're spending money, like things like this, um, and, and investing your team. I think where we where most companies are flawed is there's no inflow for the at the top of the org chart. There's nothing above the entrepreneur feeding into them. And so I think this is why it's critical. So I invest, I probably spend about I don't know, I spend at least six figures annually just on coaches and mentors. Hmm. 
I have three coaches right now affecting different areas of my business. And I think um, it's that inflow that I'm able to get that allows me to consistently have value to offer to the marketplace and to benefit my clients. And it comes out in ways that I don't even expect. Like a client will ask me a question or be stuck on something mindset wise or be challenged with something. And I'm like, I had, I had that issue and I had talked with that through with, you know, my coach, you know, or I had done that in that training that I had done or, or whatever it might be. And so I think, I think as entrepreneurs, we need to invest in ourselves if we're expecting other people to invest in us. And when you go to prospects or clients and you say, Hey, invest in me, spend money with my company and you aren't willing to do invest in yourself or in your company in, in a similar fashion, I think there's a little lack of integrity. I think energetically something's off. And so if there were seventh, I would say that that's a big one is make sure that you're investing consistently in your own development, not just your team, and so that you have something to give. And I think that's, that's the inflow. Uh, you don't want to be a dead sea. <laughs> there needs to be inflow and there needs to be outflow. And that's where there's life. You know, that's where so, it's so, a healthy business. So for the person that would say, hey, that sounds great, but like I'm working 70 hours a week. Like how, I don't have time to invest in me. I'm just give, give, give. What would you say to them? I would say they're ineffective and they're inefficient because if we're doing, 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 we move out of the mode of being effective. That means most of our time is tactical instead of strategic. And any business that lacks the business owner lacks strategic time, the business isn't growing. There's a direct relationship between the amount of strategic time, planning, looking towards the future, coming up with ideas or uh, getting trained or learning new things versus their growth. If all of their time is tactical, they're dealing with maintenance, fires, leases, managing their team, emails, phone calls. If all their time is tactical, their business can't grow it will stay basically where it is. And so I think what I do with clients is I start them with a time study and we create time. Everybody's spending time doing stuff that's unnecessary or low mm -hmm. dollar an hour work or silly. And it's, it's pretty simple to start getting clarity on that first. And then that helps them see what they need next. My entire foundation of my company really has been built on time studies. And mm -hmm. that's where I think fundamentally there's a huge difference between um, how I would coach uh, operationally a business to run versus um, something like traction or rocket fuel or, or these other systems where they're saying, here's the magic org chart and here's the roles that you have to have. It, ultimately, a business should be built around the entrepreneur and what they actually need. And the only way to really see that is to know where your time's going. Good stuff. So, Good stuff. <laughs> so that's my two cents. I like so, it. All right, so that's number eight, maybe. I don't know. That's number so, eight. <laughs> <laughs> we better stop before we, we get too better. many numbers. I know, there. I know. You're making me think of too many other things. <laughs> so, Mark, it was really awesome hanging out here with you. Um, this was really fun. You're you're welcome back anytime. Um, before we go, how can people get in touch with you if they're curious about some of the stuff that you offer for property managers, or they they want to learn more about your business or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, the best way to reach me is through our, uh, our website, which is property management system. That's all spelled out, propertymanagementsystem.org, propertymanagementsystem.org. And, uh, and we've got a handful of things on there, a lot of video resource things. Um, we've got our system manuals. We talked a little about that, like our, our actual system manuals. We offer those. You can download samples of those. And we've got nice. packages on those. We do uh, ancillary business training. Uh, some coaching stuff uh, from that aspect. Um, one thing I'm pretty excited about, we're, we're just putting in place, we actually just put it in place and, and I'm happy to share it with any of your folks if, if they're interested, they can drop me an email. Um, we put kind of a, a, a business health checkup uh, form where, where you answer, answer some questions and it kind of spits out a number uh, to let you do that business health checkup. So if anybody uh, is interested in that, drop me an email, go on the website, reach out to me from there, I'll be happy to send it to them. All right, Mark, thanks so much for coming on the Door Grow Show and uh, excited to see what you do in the future. Jason, thank you. It was fun. All right. So if you are a property management entrepreneur and you are struggling, you are feeling challenged in growth, be sure to connect with us over at Door Grow. I would be honored to help you out. And uh, I, as I said during this call, I'm a firm believer in getting coached, getting coaches, and, you know, even if it's not me, somebody like Mark, there's lots of other people there that 
can coach you, uh, get somebody that can give you some value and help you uh, grow your business and help you achieve your goals and figure things out. So um, until next time, everybody, um, to our mutual growth. Bye, everyone.